Uh, so I pray, Lord, that uh, as we uh, try to uh, discern the times uh, for the days are evil, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, give us a biblical footprint on on where we where we uh, can walk, and that is in the light of your word, and in terms of um, the uh, times associated with the Antichrist, the times associated with with uh, uh, current events, uh, help us just to get a picture um, of, of what is uh, um, going on, Lord. We So far we are here still on this earth, Lord. You haven't taken your people, Lord, via the rapture. Um, and so right now we're just trying to understand, get a feel for what's going on. And so um, help us understand um, a little of, of these things uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we are covering, um, I think we're actually trying to touch on um, last week's lesson. I think we we're trying to finish that up. I said I wanted to finish that. <laughs> And so I'm going to touch on that real quick, um, and then we're going to move on to um, some more new, more new information regarding that. Does it, does anybody um, um, okay? All right. I'm trying to remember where we left off in the notes last week. Um, we were at the end. Give me a few seconds, final shot. Okay, yeah, let me finish here. We were talking about, um, I think we were looking at what Jesus was doing. Oh, yeah, okay, I remember now. So we're at the second coming. Jesus comes. He uh, lands, you know, on the earth, and we're talking major devastation. Um, um, it's obvious that we're we're familiar with the second coming, but we're not too familiar with the devastation that occurs when Jesus comes to wipe the floor clean of his um, enemies. And we were looking on page. Um, 77. This is what I would call the aftermath. I'm going to try to go through this fairly quickly because I have a lot to share with the next chapter. Somebody had asked a question about, um, I also want to cover very briefly um, if America is in prophecy. And we're going to be talking about that. Um, that's actually discussed in chapter 8 of this um, book. And so um, although I want to answer the question, I can touch on it briefly. I don't want to give it completely away, but I can just, I can really just give a, uh, uh, a quick answer simply just to say that even though that there is no um, mention of um, America in Bible prophecy, there have been some that have tried to link certain scriptures um, that would potentially give or lend to the possibility that America is in Bible prophecy. Um, prophecy. Um, so hold that thought for now. And um, I'll hold that just by saying, I don't see, there is no mention of America in prophecy. Um, some do refer to some references in the uh, Old Testament that may lend to that. We'll get to that um, um, next week. Assuming the rapture doesn't happen. <laughs> so we're on page 77. We're going to go through this real quick. We're on after the battle. This is after the battle. This is what happens to um, Jesus' enemies. And the it's, it's, uh, there's a summary of what happens. There's a call to a feast. There's a call to a feast. Um, it talks about... Uh, uh, in Ezekiel 39, verse 17 and um, um, 17 to 20, I'll just go ahead and read it for you. It says, As for you, son of man, says the Lord God, 
speak to every kind of bird and to every beast of the field. Assemble and come together from every side to, to my sacrifice, which I am going to sacrifice for you as a great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel that you may eat flesh and drink blood. You will eat the flesh of mighty men and drink the blood of princes of the earth as though they were rams, lambs, goats, and bulls, all of them fatlings of Bashan. So you will eat fat until you are glutted. Man, that, that <laughs> the imagery is um, very clear. It's very amazing. You're going to eat fat until you're glutted at my table with horse and, and charioteers, with mighty men, and all the men of war declares the Lord God. That's right out of Ezekiel 39, 17 to 20. And so there's going to be another bank, uh, uh, a similar banquet that's going to that's going to happen after the battle of after the battle of Armageddon, um, at the end of the tribulation, where it talks about that. I mentioned that last week as another battle. Um, some of this is confusing. I don't know how to quite make sense of this because. This is a, a time, I think perhaps there's maybe one of those time texts um, there where it's hard to make out in chronology um, when this war is happening or this war is happening. I know that there is, again, there's a debate between when the battle, when the battle of Armageddon is going to take place. Is it the beginning of the tribulation? Is that the end of the millennium? Um, it, it's, it's, good men disagree on that. Um, I'm I, I am I'm not quite too sure um, um, exactly where I I mean I I'm a traditional uh, I hold to the, to the traditional view that the battle of Armageddon is gonna is gonna converge um, uh, at the second coming I think I accidentally said um, um, at the beginning of the tribulation I know that there's some debate with there but with that it's I, I wish I could be more clear with that. I'm, I'm not exactly too sure. Um, I just hold to the traditional view, um, again, that it's, it happens at the uh, second coming. And then, but apparently Mark Hitchcock thinks that, that um, this battle happens at the beginning of the tribulation and it expands, it, it goes all the way until I think the, uh, um, at to the uh, to the second coming, uh, it's possible. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm open for I'm open to it, and so I'm not trying to be confusing with this area. I just know that there's going to be a battle, okay, a major battle. <laughs> so you have the cleansing of the land. Um, Jesus comes. You have the call to the feast. He's calling all the all the all the the birds come to this feast, and then in. Uh, Ezekiel 39 talks about that the cleansing of the land entails two events, uh, and it has to do with the sanitation squads that, that are going to come and they're going to comb the countryside. But get this, it says they're going to comb the countryside uh, for seven months. Seven months is a long time. If you think about that, that's a lot of dead bodies for a long, for a long period of time that they're cleaning up. That's how nasty this battle is. Um, and then it says that the bodies aren't going to be buried quickly. And again, seven months. Just again, just summarizing. That's the, and then it talks about the second phase of the cleansing of the land. Will it involve the burning, the leftover weapons for seven years? That's Ezekiel 39, 9, and 10. And, and it describes the, the weapons used during this invasion. So Ezekiel refers to, quote-unquote, shield and bucklers and bows and arrows and wars and clubs and spears. And it also mentions horses and as a means of transportation for the invading army. Um, and so, again, you have the birds that are, the birds are, calling to, are being called to this feast. And now you have the cleanup of the... Um, of the weapons, and then you have um, Christ confirming himself as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We're on page uh, 80 right now with, um, with this information here. It says here, I will, bring, I, will, I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am sanctified through you 
before their eyes, O Gog. I will magnify myself, sanctify myself, and make myself known in the sight of many nations, and they will know that I am the Lord. And I will send fire upon Magog and those who inhabit the coastlands in safety. And they will know that I am the Lord. Do you see that? Jesus is putting himself on display and the nations see it. My holy name I will make known in the midst of, of my people Israel. And I will not let my holy name be profaned any more. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. And I will set my glory among the nations, and the, and the house of Israel will know that I am their God from that day onward. It's a beautiful picture. It's a terrifying picture also as well. And let's go ahead and reach the, uh, the conclusion of these notes here. And uh, then we're going to get to some new information. Now, it says there are numerous conclusions that you can draw from Ezekiel 38 and 39, but here's some, here's some uh, uh, um, thoughts that would, to, to gather our minds around. You have what is today as an axis of nations that surround Israel. You have the far enemies or outer ring of nations will conspire and come against Israel in the latter years to get rid of Israel once and for all. There's a slow, there's a slow convergence, for instance, a, uh, going on right now over in um, in Iran. Iran wants to take over uh, Syria. I said to see before, and they're trying to get that access to surround Israel. That's going on. It's, this isn't the first time, by the way, that 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 Israel's enemies have tried to um, uh, do this. And so you have the the uh, the invasion of Israel will be a surprise attack occurring during the first half of the seven year tribulation. When Israel is living in peace and prosperity under a coming peace treaty that will be, that, that will be forged by the Antichrist. <clears throat> you have the number one issue in the Middle East today is the, the yearning for peace in, uh, between Israel, the Palestinians, and Israel, um, Israel's other um, uh, or near uh, neighbors. Israel has longed for peace for a long period of time, but because of the religious views of the Palestinians, that will not happen. Um, and then when Israel is invaded and it appears that she is finished, God will dramatically intervene to destroy the avalanche of allies and will even send shockwaves of judgments against the homeland um, of the invaders. He goes on to say that God's demonstration of power and greatness will be so overwhelming that the nations will be forced to acknowledge that he alone is the true God. We just read that. The people of Israel will begin to recognize there is, that there is no one like their God and will experience a turning to the Lord. You have the people of Israel will begin to recognize, I'm sorry, God is sovereign, which is true. <laughs> he controls nations and nature. No one can stand against him. God is the only savior and he is the only one who can deliver um, nations and individuals. Salvation is found in no one else, and turning to him and trusting him in him is your only hope. And then he concludes talking about Jesus is coming for those who have come to him. And then we get to chapter 7 with regard to Iran, um, Israel and Iran are at war. Now, I just, that was a quick, quick and fast and a hurry um, summary of the end of the um, notes you have to forgive me my nose is is running a bit and i'm just like oh you can't see my nose run and so i'm trying to <laughs> i'm trying to get tissue and trying to keep my nose from running um before we begin do you have any does anybody have any questions at all with the uh with the new information i'm going to be we're going to be talking about Maybe it's just one of those mornings. <laughs> okay, we're going to go ahead and um, begin. The chapter opens with a quote from um, Timothy Furnish. And in this quote, um, he writes, and if, again, feel free to, to you know, give me your thoughts on anything at any point here. 
Uh, it says, opposition to and vilification of the Jewish state is ingrained in modern Iran's DNA. Now, we, we know that. We know that. And you're going to see some videos I have. I'm going to be, I'm going to be, uh, we're going to be watching together here. You know, it's, it's just, you know, it, all it is is just confirming what the, what the, um, this chapter of the book is saying. And then you have another individual. He's, his name is um, Abbas. Um, his last name, uh, Nilfar Hushan. He's a deputy commander of operations of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard um, Corps. He said, Iran has, in, has encircled Israel from all four sides. Nothing will be left of Israel. <laughs> and I've said before, and I will say it again, that if you remember nothing from this course, if you remember nothing at all, just remember one thing, that Israel stands at the center of prophetic fulfillment in the last days. And so if we want to know where we are on God's prophetic clock. Israel is God's timepiece. Israel is God's timepiece. Adrian Rogers um, um, highlighted this to some degree or another when he said that we are living in dangerous days in which we, we live. He says the storm clouds are gathering, the lightning is flashing, and the lightning rod is Israel. Christians cannot deny or ignore the significance of the nation of Israel. The eyes of the entire world are upon the tiny state of Israel. And your eyes need to be there too, because the Jews and Israel and are the people and the land of destiny. As the, Jews, as the Jew goes, so goes the world. Israel is God's yardstick. Israel is God's measuring rod. Israel is God's blueprint. Israel is God's program for what he is doing in Israel the world. And then you have another author. His name is Charles Dyer. He's a Middle East expert. I think he still lives there now. He goes to see, um, much, does much of his travel. Um, he, uh, he said that God gave Israel a starring role in his drama of the ages, and Israel will again take center stage in the final act. You cannot understand the future. That's so important. You cannot understand the future without understanding their part assigned to Israel and the future of Israel. The reason why there's much of the turmoil and the conflict and the angst and the fighting, the reason why you have Israel surrounded and the infighting and, and the political mess, I mean, it's just, it's just ugly there, bec is because of futures, uh, Israel's ties to the covenant promises that God um, has made with the nation. It all goes back to the covenant. Now, I don't have time to to get into that, but I would recommend a book on a subject by Stephen Kreloff. It's called God's Plan for Israel on a study of Romans 9 through 11. That is an excellent, excellent, excellent book. It talks about um, how he, the way he ties into the, you know, um, in uh, biblical history um, to the present of the importance of Israel. He bases it on 9 and 11. Uh, give me, can you, if you don't mind, give me two seconds. My nose is running. I just want to, I'll try not to, I'm going to put you on mute for a second, okay? <laughs> I hate, you get to see part of the real me here, you know? I'm just going to minimize the effect, all right? I'm going to put it on mute real quick. Give me two seconds. I'm alive. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't uh, woke up in the morning and I was all congested. Just like, man, this is not gonna be a good day. You said, um, uh, you said the, the book was God's plan for Israel. Yes. God's plan for Israel, a study of Romans nine 11. And his name is Stephen Kreloff. I like the beard, buddy. I like that beard, man. It's pretty nice. Okay. I found it. <laughs> All right. As one, well, I'll be recommending some more books as t as we go through this. Now, um, I have some of my own notes here. 
with regards to how how important and how vital it is to understand passages with regards to the nation of Israel and um, her importance to the future. For instance, in Isaiah 11, verse 12, it says that God, he will raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Another one is in Joel chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. It says, For behold, in those days, and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will, gather, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage, and my her- my, and my heritage Israel, because they have scattered them among the nations and have divided up my land and daniel chapter 12 verse 1 it says at that time shall my, shall arise michael the great prince who has charge of your people people meaning israel and there shall be a time of trouble such as has ne- has um, never been since there was a nation till that time but at that time your people shall be delivered everyone whose name shall be found uh, shall be found written in the book. And there's another passage here, right from Isaiah chapter 11, um, 10 and 12, it says this, it says, in that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. In that day, the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that remains of his people from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the coastlands of the sea. He will raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished ones of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And so he's going to regather them again. So in other words, you, what you see presently right now in the Middle East is a small, tiny nation of Israel. Wait till Jesus gathers them again. He's going to gather them from the four corners. And so that's just a slice of what you see presently. That's just a small amount. When he comes again, and you can cross-reference that with Matthew 24, 31. It says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give us light. And then it talks about Jesus coming down. And he said he's going to send his angels out to gather the elect. And that's a... That reference there is a quote from Isaiah 11, 10, and 12, refers to the gathering of Israel, the regathering of Israel a second time. It's the second time it's going to happen again. Um, Jeremiah 31, 36, it says, If this fixed order depart from before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being what? From being a nation before me forever. So it's pretty serious. You know, um, eschatology does mean something, okay? Um, the, it's important uh, that you get Israel right on, 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 uh, when, it, when it comes to this Israel. If you understand Israel and, her, and the prophecies surrounding Israel, you, and you understand those rightly, you're, you are well on your way to, to understanding um, Bible prophecy, if nothing else. Now, again, here's some more information. I put it in your notes. This is from Abner Chow. If you want to see how the Old Testament connects the dots with the New Testament in terms of, 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 of how to understand prophecy, you want to get that book from Abner Chow. It's called The Hermeneutics of the Biblical Writers. The, Herman, the Hermeneutics of the Biblical Writers. Learning to interpret scripture from the prophets and apostles. So you're in good hands. And if for whatever reason your dog eats up this paper or whatever it is, your parakeet, I don't care. Um, just send me an email. All right, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you more information on this stuff. But just a cursory study of these passages is clear that Israel is at the epicenter of, of literal prophecy and fulfillment in the last days. Here's another passage from Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1, 1 to 3. Now, Now, this one is an amazing prophecy because this is... Uh, I believe going on uh, today. It says here, the burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. It says, thus declares the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. 
Behold, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. It will also come about in that day. So now it's talking about there's going to be a particular day, a particular day and time where it, 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 it's going to be that siege, okay, that, that, that attack upon Israel. It's going to come, uh, come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will be severely injured, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. It says all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. That's um, quite frightening. Who is going to be able to turn that tide? What person is going to be able to, to speak with such eloquence um, in those days? And I think it's going to be the Antichrist who's going to, be, who's going to have that ability to turn the nations against Israel. Right now, not all the nations are. So, oh, I just feel the need to sneeze. <laughs> I'm getting ready to mute it just in case. John MacArthur says this. In light of that passage, he says, Jerusalem is pictured as a large basin from which the nations will figuratively drink with eagerness, only to find them becoming intoxicated, disoriented, and thus easy prey for divine judgment at the end of Daniel's 70th week in, ba in, the, in the Battle of Armageddon when nations gather to, to attack Jerusalem. Any thoughts at all? Hold on again, please. Just my uh, nose is acting up. I'm going to put you on mute real quick. Okay. Um, Let's see here. Just for those who are jumping in um, um, late, we are on uh, page eighty-seven and eighty-eight. We're getting ready to. I'm getting ready to quote from a um, a section with regards to uh, uh, Mark Hitchcock here, and so Mark Hitchcock said in re regard to the um, um, uh, or Iran. This is on page, um, again, 87, 88. He is talking about uh, the, you know, the, the passage from Zechariah 12, you know, Israel being a cup of trembling to the nations. And then he says this, he says, what's happening in Israel today bears a, rem a uh, remarkable correspondence to this ancient prophecy, but even more specifically to the war of Ezekiel 30 and 39. And then he says this, he says, Israel is at war. She's been at war with Iran since the Islamic Revolution of 1979. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we talk about Israel's shadow. Israel's shadow war. Has anybody ever, has anybody ever heard of Israel's shadow war? I say that because... I remember getting into a, I, I, don't, I don't remember the context of how it started, but usually most of my interaction happens at work. A lot of inter my inter interaction happens at work. Or it's online, um, um, on Facebook. And we were talking about Israel and Iran. And this person told me that Iran, I forget the words he used, but something to the effect where Iran has... Has not or never directly attacked, has not has not attacked Israel, and it's all Israel's fault for being this oppressor against Iran or something like that. Something of that nature. And there's a there was a kernel of truth to what that person was saying. At the, at the time I didn't know how to, you know, um, to um, to respond to it except to say that Israel is is in a shadow war with iran and um because what does that mean what does a shadow war mean we're going to talk about it right now real quick in other words it's just a quick reference to 
um, um, Israel doing everything they can behind the scenes to try to slow down Israel's aggression against them. Again, we're on page um, 88. Now, and then we're going to watch a video regarding the um, the shadow war. Because I was looking, because I don't know what the, I didn't, I just wanted more proof, like a shadow war. Okay. Um, we're going to watch a video in a couple of seconds here. But the first paragraph with regards to the shadow war is that Israel has engaged in a very long term shadow war with Iran to neutralize the potential threat. Israel has carried out numerous very effective cyber attacks against um, Israel's nuclear mega megaplex. Some of you may have heard about that. She has also assassinated a host of Iranian nuclear scientists to slow down Iran's progress toward the nuclear finish line. I remember on the news, um, Israel had, had, um, had uh, uh, killed some of the scientists. They had, um, um, were driving on motorcycles in, in a very heavy, heavy populated area, and they stuck some sort of a sticky bomb on the car, and they took off. And it was all over the news. And the car blew up and killing um, a number, killing the, 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 uh, the people inside. Now, I mean, um, the whole point is not to justify that. It's just to say that there's a shadow war going on. That's just the whole point. I don't know what to think about stuff like that on those, on those, on those kinds of, you know, on those levels there as to whether or not they're justified, whether, they're, whether, you know, whether they're justified or not. The, but it is to say that it just confirms that there is something serious going on and, it, and Israel's trying to stop um, Iran. Here's a video I'm going to show you right now just to, just to sort of give you a, a sense of where your feet are in this area here. Let me just get this all ready. Um, okay, there it is. Let me get us ready. All right, share screen. Share computer and sound. Optimize screen share for video. Okay, can you see the video? Yes. All right. Now it's not, uh, hopefully no stupid commercial is gonna come on. <laughs> I was looking up some videos. I'm going to go ahead and refresh this page. <laughs> All right. Hello, Shia. <coughs> At his home in Iran, a man is weighing up whether he should go and fight in a foreign conflict, along with friends who are already there. Eventually, he decides to leave his children, bidding goodbye to Iran's mullahs too, who will pay him up to $600 a month to fight in far off Syria. It's a recruitment advert aired on Iranian state TV last year, but there's no mention of money here. Instead, an appeal to destroy Sunni jihadists, including ISIS, and defend the tomb of Zainab in Damascus, one of Shia Islam's holiest shrines. <laughs> Iran has recruited an army of Shia fighters to prop up President Assad and to extend an arc of Shia influence from Tehran all the way to the Mediterranean, which has Washington and its allies rattled. Iran provides arms, financing and training and funnels foreign fighters into Syria. It has also sent members of the Iran Revolutionary Guards to take part in direct combat operations. South of Aleppo, in Syria, and the master of those operations is about to make a very rare public appearance. He's Qasim Soleimani, the commander of Iranian military missions overseas and credited with turning the tide of Syria's war. Okay, real quick footnote. You do know he's dead now. We killed him. 
in a in a drone strike what like um i mean what not even a year it's not it's yeah i think he was getting ready to come against he was planning a major attack this is like the number one general in iran like this dude is like um is is a serious issue and he was getting ready to come against he was he was performing a a, a very big attack against um um, oh my goodness! Oh, it's slipping my mind. It was just a very major attack against America, and America preempted that attack and blew him to smithereens. And then they posted the, <laughs> they posted the the, uh, the pictures of the blown up um, um, uh, car that he was in, and some other you know gruesome pictures. Anyway, that's the dude. هذا الناس من جانب الله سبحانه وتعالى أهل لازم ما يفرز هذا هر هذا نفسه نفع الله سبحانه وتعالى in this adoring crowd are Iraqi, Lebanese and Afghan fighters, as well as Iranians. So he speaks to them in a mixture of Persian and Arabic, though they are all fighting under the banner of Shia Islam. At first, Soleimani had sent the Assad regime these military advisers from Iran's Revolutionary Guard. This covert mission ended in disaster when they were caught in a cornfield by a Syrian rebel ambush. It was too late. All these men were killed. This footage was captured by Syrian rebels who then published it, proving that Iran had boots on the ground, though officials in Tehran denied it. Hezbollah was Iran's first proxy force in Syria. Fellow Shia fighters based in Lebanon, but funded and trained by the Iranians, diverted by their leader from their lifelong mission to confront Israel to save President Assad instead. <laughs> In 2014, Channel 4 News was given rare access to the funeral of a Hezbollah fighter killed in Syria. Their losses were mounting in what had turned into a proxy war with Sunni rebels funded by Turkey, the Saudis and other Gulf states. So Syria's president made a plea for more help. The Iranians found that manpower sympathetic to the cause. Iraqi, Afghan and even Pakistani fighters, some of them Hezbollah lookalikes. It was cheaper than using Iranian men, there was no public backlash, and it was plausibly deniable too. Though by last year, Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, was openly visiting the families of those who had died fighting in Syria. About a thousand dead, according to one official. This religious war now too big to hide. جان خودشون رو سپر قرار دادند برای اینکه دست این بدخواهان و این خبیث ها به حرم اهل بیت درست And nowhere was Iran more focused than the battle for Aleppo This jeep fighting on that front is Iranian armed and Iranian built Russian airstrikes pave the way for victory, but it's believed up to 8,000 Iranian-backed fighters took the lead on the ground. In December, their commander, Qasim Soleimani, made another rare appearance, this time inside the recaptured city. The architect of plans to extend Shia military power across the Middle East. 
in a mission which, at its most daring, could secure a land corridor from Iran through Iraq to Syria and the Mediterranean Sea. Though the Americans see this as dangerous Iranian meddling. Iran is the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism and is respons um. responsible for intensifying multiple conflicts and undermining U.S. interest in countries such as Syria. Okay, that's, that's good for now. Um, so that's a quagmire of what's going on over there, right? I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a, lot, of in, there's a lot of interest, a lot of different, you know, militia groups in there. Um, but the, the thing that I wanted you to see is, is Iran is trying to get into Syria. They're trying to create their axis of evil. I don't know how many are in there, honestly. If anybody knows more than I do, feel free to go ahead and, 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 and um, um, you know, to comment on that. But this, this, again, this is just, just some more stuff. One of Iran's tentacles, and the video mentioned it, is, is, um, is Hezbollah. It's Hezbollah. That's noted on, um, on page nine, um, 89 where, um, where, where it says that Israel is at war with Iran's main proxy in Lebanon, which is Hezbollah, which means party of God. But Hezbollah is, is, is as, the, as the author would, would note, it's, it's, I mean, has its interests with Iran as well, but they're ferocious, they're formidable. They sit at Israel's northern doorstep waiting to... Um, attack Israel upon Iran's command, and so again, there's, it's just some more information. And then they're, you know, they're training in Syria. Um, they're, they're. Uh, it's just bad in that area. In other words, I got another video for you here. Um, I want to make sure I have it. I have the correct video here. Let's see here. I got this. This is in the way. <laughs> My apologies. The screen sharing is keeping me from. Give me two seconds. Stop share. And then we go to the video. And then. <laughs> um, any thoughts? Anybody want to comment at all? Is any of this helpful, you find, or um, anything confusing, anything at all? I mean, um, any disagreement? Um, I think it's very helpful, um, very insightful, scary, but it's, it's real. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. I'm just trying. I'm, I'm going to lift up the video in a different way from the notes itself, and I just I just went to my notes here, and so because I couldn't find the video, I thought I had it saved, but I didn't. Um, oh, anyway, you know what? We'll go ahead and skip that for now. We'll go ahead and skip that. Give me get back to the uh, the notes here, so I can just continue to move on. So you have you have Hezbollah in the north. Okay, they're they're one of the arms in. Um, um, oh, where are you? Where are you guys? There you are. You have um, you have Iran and those who are I'll just say those who are um, in association in association with Iran who want Israel dead. And they're trying to surround. If you have it, you have you have conflict in the north, and now you have and then you have conflict in the south. We have um, Palestine, uh, Palestinian jihadists in the south. That's also noted on page 89, that Iran controls Israel's foes to the south, so not just the north, now also the south. Um, they are also, um, um, is an, they're another arm or tentacle of Iran, and whatever Iran tells them to do, they're just gonna go ahead and do it because, because Iran gives them money to go ahead and, and, and do these things. And they act as, a, uh, as one of those agitators um, against, Israel um, in that region. Mark Hitchcock said this, and he's, he said this on page 90. This, I thought it was fascinating. It's the second and fourth paragraph. I'll start with the second paragraph where he says this. He says that the growing crisis shows, again, no, no sign of slowing down. 
Israel has embedded itself. Um, I'm sorry, Iran has embedded itself in Syria. That's, that's what the video shows. Um, or they're trying to get in there. Uh, I'm not sure how, what, what, what degree they, they've embedded themselves in there, but they're just there. At least we know that. Um, Hezbollah is in, is in um, entrenching and hardening in Lebanon. Palestinian Islamic Jihad is thriving in the Gaza. Uh, we'll, we'll, have, we'll talk about that as well, um, where that location is. Israel is working to prevent or at least impede these ongoing threats. That's the current showdown in a nutshell. Uh, Israel will keep striking Iran's assets in Syria. They're, they're doing that today. Um, uh, they're going to keep on um, attacking those assets. <clears throat> Eventually, Iran and Hezbollah won't take it anymore. And ultimately, Israel will reach a point where more um, force is required. And those scenarios can come about separately or simultaneously. In either case, war is going to break out, possibly engulfing the region. And so then he's, um, he goes on and talks about at the last paragraph here on page 90, says that everyone yearns for a diplomatic solution to the, show, to the showdown. And it's true. Um, they know that that place can go up at any, at any point. It's, it's just a powder keg. It's, it's just um, an extremely bad situation over there. And then we get to the section on page 91 where we're on more than meets the eye with regards to all of this. Um, <clears throat> you have, with the increase of, 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 of anti-Semitism, I want you to note this, with the increase of, of, of anti-Semitism, not just there, but with the increase of, of anti-Semitism, even in our country and in other parts of the world, what that has done is that that is, is, is causing the, the individual Israelites or Jewish people to... Um, um, to return to their homeland of safety, okay? And there's that, so the Lord is using the providential circumstances of the persecution going on, not just in Israel, but in all parts of the world to push them back to their homeland for safety. And there's an article on that if you want to read that. It's from Vox News. I, I gave it in your footnote there. How did Israel become a country in the first place? It's all because of the persecution. The persecution pushed them all back, and the Lord is using that kind of persecution so that when it when it comes time, um, in the um, when for Christ to come, they're they're going to be a you know a big cluster like there is now of um, of uh, Israel to finally see their um, Messiah. The history of the of of this between the Jewish people and their neighbors. It goes back to Genesis chapter 12. I think I said this, I touched on this briefly, but I didn't get to finish the point, but I'm going to finish it here. What's going on there goes all the way back to Genesis 12. You have God covenant with Abraham. He, he, he made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The, in other words, the covenant was given to Israel. It wasn't given to anybody else. We have the covenant entailed land, seed, and blessing. You have but you have Israel, I'm sorry, Islam today, they claim that our Bible was, um, was corrupted and that Israel didn't really inherit the covenant blessings. And that, that part of the scripture has to be conveniently corrupted. <laughs> you see how this is where this is going? And so Israel's um, uh, ancient enemy doesn't want peace with Israel. They want to destroy and make a claim of the land that doesn't belong to them by divine decree. And their reasoning is inherently religious. Again, this is what I said, you know, this is what I said before. But this is a hey, footnote. Oh, go ahead. Pastor Morgan, a quick thought. Um, just for um, point C specifically, um, when you may uh, encounter um, a Muslim friend, you guys are talking about the differences between the Bible and Quran. This is not really related to the class, but just um, just as a help. Um, the way that we refute claim C in general is very simple. Um, Islam uh, obviously believes that the, the Quran is, is the word of God. However, the Quran also says that the Bible is a prev uh, previous revelation from Allah, right? Mm -hmm. They also will say, though, this exact statement that, well, the Bible has been corrupted. And then all you need to do is just ask them, can the words of Allah 
be corrupted. The Quran yeah. specifically says no. So if that's the case, then their claim that the Bible text has been corrupted actually goes counter to what the Quran says. But because the Quran says that the Bible is a previous revelation of God and the Bible says that you cannot add on to this revelation that makes the Quran false. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's, it's in, internally <laughs> refuted um in a pretty easy apologetic if you ever get into that conversation thanks thank you for that footnote definitely appreciate that for sure i have a nephew who's um who's muslim and he i've had lots of conversations with him but he it's the same argument they use the same thing you know like text was corrupted uh like danny had mentioned in the apologetic that we can use to um, refute that but that's just what they believe they believe that they inherited the promise they inherited the land and so because they believe that they inherited the promise and they inherited the land can you see why there's turmoil <laughs> can you see that turmoil now it all goes back to bible history many people don't know that oh, by the way i know that the focus today is on um um, Israel as a state and then the Palestinians wanting a state of their own. There are at least 17 um, Arab states. There are at least 17 um, Arab states. I mean, I, this is another book. This is the book that I had mentioned before. Did I mention it? Well, if not, I'm mentioning it now. It's called The Mountains of Israel, The Bible and the West Bank by Norma Parrish Archbold. And in this book, it talks about the biblical history pertaining to the covenant and to the and to Israel in the present. It does a really good job. And in this book, it talks about the Arab the Arabic states. Here's here's some of them right now: Algeria, Sudan, Libya, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Morocco, Syria, Egypt, Oman, um, Jordan, Kuwait, and so forth and so forth. Just, she's just giving a list of the different states. So they have all these different states. But but again, why is it a problem with Israel wanting to have a state of their own? Well, it goes back to biblical history. They believe that they inherited that land. Yeah, they have other Arab states, but they want Israel. They want Israel, and that's um. And I, I I mean, you can't get more prophetic than 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 that. I believe um, in setting up the end stage the the end stage scenario. That that's the reason why all that infighting is going on there. And now we got some, um, <clears throat> I have some more videos for you here. Let me see if I can pull these up. Um, okay, let me get rid of this video here. Give me, uh, page four. My nose is doing horrible things. I Man, I am so sorry. It is, is it, why is it? Okay, yep, got it. Let me just pull up the, um, let's skip the ad. I just thought this video was helpful with regards to, this video is, is from, um, where are you guys? Let me find you again here. Thank you for your patience. Seems like this morning isn't hasn't been going as well as I would like to to go to here. Um, um, Come on, man. Okay. Can you see the, can you see the, um, you are, okay, you are screen sharing. All right. Okay. I am screen sharing. Can you see my notes? Okay. I'm just double checking. Okay. All right. Here we go. Um, let me know if you can hear. If Israel just allowed the, yes. can you hear that? Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Palestinians to have a state of their own. If Israel just allowed the Palestinians to have a state of their own, there would be peace in the Middle East, right? 
That's what you hear from UN ambassadors, European diplomats, and most college professors. But what if I told you that Israel has already offered the Palestinians a state of their own, and not just once, but on five separate occasions? Don't believe me? Let's review the record. After the breakup of the Ottoman Empire following World War I, Britain took control of most of the Middle East, including the area that constitutes modern Israel. Seventeen years later, in 1936, the Arabs rebelled against the British and against their Jewish neighbors. The British formed a task force, the Peel Commission, to study the cause of the rebellion. The commission concluded that the reason for the violence was that two peoples, Jews and Arabs, wanted to govern the same land. The answer, the Peel Commission concluded, would be to create two independent states, one for the Jews and one for the Arabs, a two-state solution. The suggested split was heavily in favor of the Arabs. The British offered them 80% of the disputed territory, the Jews the remaining 20%. Yet, despite the tiny size of their proposed state, the Jews voted to accept this offer. But the Arabs rejected it and resumed their violent rebellion. Rejection number one. Ten years later, in 1947, the British asked the United Nations to find a new solution to the continuing tensions. Like the Peel Commission, the UN decided that the best way to resolve the conflict was to divide the land. In November 1947, the UN voted to create two states. Again, the Jews accepted the offer. And again, the Arabs rejected it. Only this time, they did so by launching an all-out war. Rejection number two. Jordan, Egypt, Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria joined the conflict. But they failed. Israel won the war and got on with the business of building a new nation. Most of the land set aside by the UN for an Arab state, the West Bank and East Jerusalem, became occupied territory. Occupied not by Israel, but by Jordan. Twenty years later, in 1967, the Arabs, led this time by Egypt and joined by Syria and Jordan, once again sought to destroy the Jewish state. The 1967 conflict, known as the Six-Day War, ended in a stunning victory for Israel. Jerusalem and the West Bank, as well as the area known as the Gaza Strip, fell into Israel's hands. The government split over what to do with this new territory. Half wanted to return the West Bank to Jordan and Gaza to Egypt in exchange for peace. The other half wanted to give it to the region's Arabs, who had begun referring to themselves as the Palestinians in the hope that they would ultimately build their own state there. Neither initiative got very far. A few months later, the Arab League met in Sudan and issued its infamous three no's. No peace with Israel, no recognition of Israel, no negotiations with Israel. Again, a two-state solution was dismissed by the Arabs, making this rejection number three. In 2000, Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak met at Camp David with Palestinian Liberation Organization Chairman Yasser Arafat mm. to conclude a new two-state plan. Barak offered Arafat a Palestinian state in all of Gaza and 94% of the West Bank, with East Jerusalem as its capital. But the Palestinian leader rejected the offer. In the words of U.S. President Bill Clinton, Arafat was here 14 days and said no to everything. Instead, the Palestinians launched a bloody wave of suicide bombings that killed over 1,000 Israelis and maimed thousands more on buses, in wedding halls, and in pizza parlors. Rejection number four. In 2008, Israel tried yet again. Prime Minister Ehud Olmert went even further than Ehud Barak had, expanding the peace offer to include additional land to sweeten the deal. Like his predecessor, the new Palestinian leader, Mahmoud Abbas, turned the deal down. Rejection number five. In between these last two Israeli offers, Israel unilaterally left Gaza, giving the Palestinians complete control there. Instead of developing this territory for the good of its citizens, the Palestinians turned Gaza into a terrorist base from which they have fired thousands of rockets into Israel. Each time Israel has agreed to a Palestinian state, the Palestinians have rejected the offer, often violently. So if you're interested in peace in the Middle East, 
Maybe the answer is not to pressure Israel to make yet another offer of a state to the Palestinians. Maybe the answer is to pressure the Palestinians to finally accept the existence of a Jewish state. I'm David Brog, Executive Director of the Maccabee Task Force for Prager University. All right, so now I know that the, it, the focus on this video has to do with the Palestinian state and the Israeli state and everything like that, but I want you to see, you know, again, behind the scenes, this is deeply religious, but also because the, those surrounding uh, Israel right now, uh, many of those are funded by Iran. Again, think shadow war, okay? Um, just think shadow war. And then let me pull up the, um, uh, well, let me pull this down and get back to the screen here. And then we will... <clears throat> So again, um, Mark Hitchcock, this, all this goes back to what Muslims believe regarding um, Abraham and the covenant blessings. This is something that Mark Hitchcock notes in his, um, in his book on page 92 when he says that the Muslims believe that, Ab that Abraham took Ishmael to Mount Moriah instead of Isaac. This is in Genesis 22. And the, he goes on, he says that they maintain that Abraham and Hagar fled to Mecca with Ishmael, where he became a prophet and an ancestor of, to Muhammad. The Bible is clear that God blessed Ishmael, quote, as for Ishmael, I have heard you, behold, I will bless him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He should become the father of 12 princes and now make him a great nation. So they're a great nation too, just alongside Israel. And then he goes on and he finishes and he says that, the, that nevertheless, the, the promised land was, de was deeded by God forever to Abraham and then to Isaac and then to um, and then to Isaac's son Jacob and his descendants, that the Jewish people owned the land, the city of Jerusalem, and the Temple Mount, according to the Bible. But the, yet the, the Muslims believe it belongs to them. Therein lies the historical rivalry and hostility. Does that help? You, <laughs> does it give you sort of a picture as to why things are happening? I mean, you have people there, the politicians, they don't know a lick about, about what the Bible says. They don't know a lick about prophecy. They're trying to resolve a tension that has been there all that goes all the way back to genesis 12 i mean there's some deep-seated history here that you, it's just not going to wash away it's just not going to wash away at all and again i mentioned to you that um, the mountains of israel the bible and the west bank by nor norma parish archibald i have it i think that that's in your notes um she does a really good job laying out that 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 um history of the uh, israeli arab conflict to this present day but the core of all of this, and we're gonna we're gonna come to a close here in a in a in a few minutes. The core of this is that the reason why you see the heart of all of this it goes back to anti-Semitism, anti -Semitism, and the person who is the greatest anti-Semite is Satan. It's all goes back. This all goes back to Satan. This whole thing. It's, it's, it's completely satanic. They, they'll, they'll, they, they'll never be able to establish any kind of peace until Messiah comes. They're gonna, it's, there's going to be a, a false peace, obviously, when Antichrist comes. And they're going to be fooled and deceived. And, 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 and you know, um, um, they're going to be under some severe attack in the, in the latter days, like, like um, um, just before, you know, Christ returns. But it all goes back to... Um, Satan just pulling, you know, pulling the strings, so to speak, using a false ideology, a false religious worldview, um, which would be, you know, Islam. And the Lord is using all of those different things in His providence and His sovereignty to to bring about the fulfillment of um, Bible prophecy. Listen to what Mark Hitchcock said here. Here's, here's some other stuff. Um, it's hard to know where to even begin here, but he said this. He said. He said that the, the, the primary driving force behind anti-Semitism is the devil. Satan is anti-Christ and anti-Semitic. He hates Jesus and he hates the Jewish people because God has a purpose and plan for the Jewish people in the end of days. God promised the Jewish people a specific piece of real estate in the Middle East in Genesis chapter 15, 18 and 21, and he gave it to them as their possession forever. When Jesus is coming back someday to fulfill that promise to Israel, he will bring the Jewish people into their promised land under his rule. And he, 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 he goes on, he says, God also promised that a Messiah from the line of the king of David would rule over Israel in their land. 
And to prevent fulfillment of that prophecy, Satan worked throughout the Old Testament to wipe out the Jewish people and specifically the line of David to keep Jesus from being born. When that failed, he tempted Jesus to sin, to disqualify him from being the Savior, Matthew 4. And when he was unsuccessful in that ploy, Satan moved the Jewish leaders and the Romans to kill him. But Jesus came back to life on the third day in accordance with Matthew 27, 28. So now Satan's last-ditch effort to derail God's program and to defeat God's um, promise, promises to Abraham and David is to eliminate the Jewish people. To eliminate the Jewish people. In so doing, Satan can thwart the promises of God. He can prevent Jesus from ruling over the Jewish people as promised. This explains the irrational hatred Israel's neighbors have for the Jewish state and the Jewish people. They are driven by a demonically inspired detest, uh, de uh, detestation of Israel. I mean, this is satanic. Satan has been trying, has, again, has been trying to destroy the Jewish people for a very, very long time because he does not, because he does not want to bring about the fulfillment, he, you know, the, the fulfillment of prophecy. Think of how arrogant that is. He actually thinks he can break prophecy. He actually thinks that he can come against God and his word. He actually thinks that, that, that the word of God really isn't infallible. It really isn't inspired. It really isn't inerrant. Everything in the book that we believe is inspired and, and infallible, and Satan does not believe that. He actually thinks that he can thwart the purposes of God by doing what he's doing over there in the, um, the Middle East. Here's some, here's some more quotes, and we'll end here. Um, I, had a, I had one last video, but I think that's okay. We, we've seen enough videos <laughs> from Dennis Prager. If you want to watch it on your own, you can. Um, Here's some quotes from uh, Michael Oren. He's the former Israeli ambassador to the United States, and he gives this sobering analysis. It's, it's, and it is really a sobering. He says this. We'll, we'll close with some of these quotes. Israel is girding for the worst and acting on the assumption that fighting could break out at any time. And it's not hard to imagine how it might arrive. The conflagration, like so many in the Middle East, could be ignited by a single spark. Israeli fighter jets have already conducted hundreds of bombing raids against Iranian targets in Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq. The result could be a counterstrike by Iran using cruise missiles that penetrate Israel's defense and smash into targets like the uh, uh, Kiryat Tel Aviv equivalent of the Pentagon. And then after a day of large-scale exchanges, the war would begin. We don't, we don't know what the catalyst is going to, you know, is going to be. But it seems like it's, in my mind, it seems like it's right around the corner. Yaakov um, Katz, editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, envisions how this war could break out. He says, the, missile, the missiles will come in low after being in the air for almost an hour. And when they hit, they'll be coming just over the horizon. People who witness the attack will, will remember later that the missiles didn't fall from the sky. They flew at their target straight like a bullet. The drones will hit just a few minutes later. They will, have fly, they, they will have been flying at low altitude for longer, taking off in Iraq, in Iraq, crossing into Syria, and then across the border into Israel. The quote-unquote swarm of drones and cruise missiles, as it will later be revealed, will have caught the country by surprise. By the time they strike, the target will be less relevant. The, uh, the Haifa oil refinery, an apartment building in Kiryat um, Shmana, or a school in Katrin. He goes on, he says this, he says, this scenario, while fiction for now, is one that the IDF top brass is talking about on a regular basis these days. It has been played out in the minds of the IDF generals and intelligence officials responsible for watching Iran's every move. From Tehran all the way to its proxies base, proxy bases in Yemen, Iraq, Syria, and Gaza Strip. The model is very similar to, it, to Iran's attack against the, Aram, the Aramco oil facility in Saudi Arabia in September. Within the span of 17 minutes, 18 drones and three low-flying missiles hit the facility with amazing precision. Tie that all in with this conclusion with the war of Gog and Magog. It hasn't happened yet. We know Iran is going to be a part of that war um, um, before Christ comes. But the, um, as, the, as this, this article concludes, that the final showdown prophesied in Ezekiel is coming, but we don't know when it's going to be. 
but just keep watching as the book would say keep watching the middle east keep keep listening keep your ears you know um attentive to what's going on um but again we'll just close that israel is on the god's prophetic time clock time clock uh, in the last days and um the hands are approaching midnight and then it closes thoughts questions cries of outrage shock i mean i'm, I'm trying i'm i hope i'm not getting you guys depressed <laughs> with all this stuff it, it really is sobering stuff i mean it really is it, I, but, but i don't know any other way to present it the book i'm pretty I'm sure the author doesn't know any way to present i mean this is just this is just this is the, this is the world that we live in this is the world that we live in right now thoughts before we close I don't, I don't think it's, um, maybe I'm just biased, but I don't think it's overtly, um, I wouldn't say depressing or discouraging, but, um, it's, it is good to, to get a dose of, of reality. Not, not that people need any more of that nowadays, but, um, if, if you spent too much time allowing this stuff to kind of go over your head, and you're not necessarily paying attention to these things. Um, not that you have to be experts in, in Middle East conflict. Uh, people spent their whole lives dedicated to this exact subject and aren't any closer to an answer. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's, it's, it's difficult and, and nuanced, but the, the overarching theme I think has been rather consistent and really it, it needs to be uh, present within our minds and hearts so that we're not being sluggish when it comes to being vigilant and, and waiting for the Lord. Constantly, our, our mandate is to be watchful for his return. Constantly, our call is, is to be vigilant and awaiting in anticipation to believe that he could really return at any moment. And I think um, books like this, subjects like these, uh, get us back in that mindset that the Bible calls us to, which is a good reminder so that um, we keep, we stop putting so much stock into all the things that are going on and we realize that, you know, it might be useful to help us uh, eliminate a hold on the world that we have um, to get ready to, to leave this earth. The new earth will be so much better. It's going to be tight. Yeah, I think this world isn't good. tight. You know, go ahead, Ross. Counter to your thought, Dave, that, you know, or the, the not thought, but discussion that is potentially depressing. I think just the opposite. It's, it's exciting. I mean, the, the aspect of, <clears throat> of prophecy being fulfilled the aspect of, or the thought that, you know, we're going to be taken out of here by, by Christ in the rapture prior to, you know, God, may God, we're not going to be around to see that stuff. I mean, if this all stuff is being fulfilled, that just means we're that much closer. And, you know, hey, Maranatha. And uh, so I look at this thing as exciting, not depressing. Anymore. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, and as I look, you know, oh, someone, someone was going to say something. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I agree. It's, it's exciting. It's, uh, if you... I guess it scares people that we're so used to the day-to-day, day-to-day, but we can't forget we are Christians. We are waiting for Christ. This is not our home. So if they're yeah. packing the bags, let's go. Let's get ready to go. That's the exciting thing. Yeah. Yeah, me, John. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. gotcha, let's Wait. go, bro. We're waiting for that trumpet, hey. right? I think the only weighty burden thing is, is realizing how imminent this is and those family members that we have that are not in Christ and how burdensome, like Danny just said, we can't be, we can't be lazy. We can't be slothful. We have to be actively pursuing, um, praying that God would draw them to himself. Mm. Yeah. And so as we look at the, at the landscape of what's going on, I, I, you know, um, I, f I forget where I read this from. I forget, but the, I'm thinking of Rome. Um, when Rome began to crumble, it took a long time for it to finally, you know, take its its last breath. 
I think it was on a uh, a 200 year decline or something like that. I forget what it was. It was it was a slow decline, but at the end it was it was bad. And so I'm. It's it's sometimes you can re- listen to the news and it can just be just completely depressing, right? And then, um, but at the same time, we do have a lot to look forward to because maybe one of the reasons why, and this is where we get into chapter eight, maybe the reason maybe the reason for America's decline is because America isn't in prophecy. And that's, that will bring us to the next chapter. Will America survive? What is America's role in the last days? I know, again, I, I think it was Jessica that had asked that question, is America in Bible prophecy? And so we're going we're gonna to get to that um, next week. Will America survive? With that said, um, I'll close in prayer and then we can be off. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this uh, this morning you've granted to us. Lord, thank you for your common grace in giving us a country, Lord, um, with with all of the, the I, I guess, uh, the blessings that are associated with it, Lord. We feel protected. We feel that the church is protected to a large degree. And so we're thankful, Lord. So many people don't understand, especially unbelievers, they don't understand how good they have it. Lord, help us understand how good we have it um, and never to take... Um, your kindness for granted in giving us a wonderful country, Lord. Thank you for the USA. Thank you, Lord, that even despite its imperf- it, the imperfections, because we're all sinners, um, falling short of, the, of God's glory. Um, you again, Lord, um, you have given this country to us um, by your grace. So help us to be good stewards of that, Lord. Um, to love our our neighbor to give them the gospel, Lord, and to, um, uh, yeah, again, give them the gospel, um, not just one verse at a time, Lord, but just give them the hope of the truth that this world is passing away and your kingdom is going to come on this earth in which righteousness dwells. And we want them to be a part of that. In Jesus' name, amen.